Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 215 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mysterious Urim and Thummim and how the Israelites use them to receive messages from God. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. The Bible records that the Jewish high priest had two mysterious objects known as the Urim and the Thummim. These objects could be used to inquire of God and receive messages from the Lord. But scholars have been perplexed by what the Bible says about them. What were the Urim and Thummim? How did they work? And what do we know about them? Well, that's what we'll be talking about in this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we know about the Urim and Thummim? Where do we first encounter them in the Bible? They're first mentioned in Exodus 28 in a passage discussing the priestly vestments that the Jewish high priest was supposed to wear. There were quite a number of different things that were part of his attire when he was serving at the temple, but three of them are relevant for our purposes. The ephod, the breast piece, and the Urim and Thummim that it contained. It can be a little hard to visualize these just by reading the text of Exodus, so here's a description that's taken from the volume on the Pentateuch in InterVarsity Press's Dictionary of the Old Testament. The high priestly ephod was a sleeveless garment made from gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen. It had a waistband of the same material and two shoulder pieces, each one with an onyx stone mounted in a gold filigree setting and each engraved with the names of six of the tribes of Israel. The gold thread cut from hammered gold sheets must have given the whole a dazzling appearance and a somewhat rigid construction, possibly allowing it to be stored in an upright position. And think about that for a moment. We have evidence that the gold threads in the ephod were rigid enough to make the garment stiff enough that you wouldn't fold it up. You just put it away and it would stand up on its own when it wasn't being worn. Also, the colors of the yarn, blue, purple, and red, were also significant. Blue and purple were the most expensive colors available and were associated with royalty and power while scarlet was associated with blood and ritual cleansing. The dyed yarn would have been wool. And I want to pause for a moment to explain why purple was such an expensive color in the ancient world. This is something I would have really loved to know as a boy, so I think a lot of kids in the audience will find this really cool. Back in the ancient world, making purple wasn't as easy as mixing red and blue dye together. I mean, you could do that, but if you did, the purple would fade and wash out of the fabric. The source of high quality purple that they had was a natural one, and it came from sea snails. The sea snail in question is known as the murex or rock snail, and it's a carnivorous predator snail. So yes, there are carnivorous predator snails. And these snails can look pretty intimidating. Uh, despite the fact they're less than a foot long, they sometimes have shells that are just covered with spikes. So these carnivorous predator sea snails are pretty metal. Um, now, the murex is native to the Mediterranean Sea in the waters just off the city of Tyre, which is in modern Lebanon, just north of Israel. So uh, when you hear in the Bible about the cities of Tyre and Sidon, that's it. That's where these snails come from. They had fishermen in Tyre who would go out on the Mediterranean Sea and capture the sea snails and then use them to make the famous purple dye, which was often called Tyrian purple after the city of Tyre. And here's the cool part that little boys will enjoy. They made the purple dye or the way they made the purple dye was to take the carnivorous predatory sea snails they'd caught, and then they'd use a difficult and secret process that they didn't tell anyone about to make the dye. But basically, you know how snails are slimy? Well, sea snails are too, and that's because they secrete mucus. So the dye makers would get the mucus from the sea snails and then run it through a secret process to make the purple dye. So, yes, the, they used the snot of spiky carnivorous sea snails 
to make their special purple dye. And there was a limited number of sea snails they could get, and the process to make the dye was really hard. And so the Tyrian purple dye that they made was really expensive because the amount they could make was so limited. But once they made it, they could use it to make purple fabrics. And instead of fading, the dye would actually get brighter when it was exposed to sunlight. It would become a brighter color of purple. And because the dye was rare and expensive, only rich people could afford it. Uh, it was a mark of prestige to be able to wear purple. And in Rome, there were even laws about who got to wear purple. But now you know that the kings and priests and potentates of the ancient world who got to wear purple clothing were actually wearing clothes that had been dyed with purple from carnivorous predatory sea snail snot. So how <laughs> cool is that? Uh, in any event, it was, it was very impressive if you were an ancient Israelite and you saw the high priest wearing the ephod with its purple, blue, and red yarn and gold threads woven into it. Opinion is divided about where on the body the ephod was worn. One view holds that it was like an apron and worn below the waist. The rendering of the Septuagint and the testimony of Josephus, however, favor the interpretation that it was worn on the upper part of the body. Such ephod-like garments have been attested in New Kingdom Egypt, indicating some cultural affinity with the Old Testament ephod. So that's what the ephod was. It appears to have been a kind of fancy sleeveless garment that the high priest would wear over his torso. Now, for the breast piece, or choshen, uh, that was attached to the ephod. The breast piece, choshen, was about nine inches square, made of the same material as the ephod, and had mounted on it 12 gems in four rows with each gem engraved like a seal with the name of an Israelite tribe. In this way, the memory of the Israelites was brought before the Lord continually. The breast piece's construction from material folded double is best interpreted as forming a pouch that held the Urim and Thummim, a means of revelation utilized by the high priest. The presence of this oracular means made the Choshen a breast piece of judgment. So because the breast piece contained the Urim and Thummim, and because you could use these to get judgments from God about what you should do, that's why they called it the breast piece of judgment. Royal and priestly breast pieces that show features similar to the Choshen have been attested in Egypt, New Kingdom, Phoenicia, 18th century BC, and Assyria from the 11th century BC. So archaeologists have found similar ephods and breast pieces elsewhere in the ancient Near East. Urim and Thummim aren't words we have in English. Do we know what these words meant in Hebrew? This isn't entirely clear. Part of both names is clear, and that's the endings of the words. Urim and Thummim both have that im sound on the end. And in Hebrew, that means the word is plural. So, for example, the Hebrew word for king is melech. So two or three kings would be melachim. You can hear the eem sound. Similarly, the word for strong man is gibor, and so strong men would be giborim. Uh, thus, we know that the urim and thumim are both plural words. If we know the ending of these words is plural, then that would make the question what the base root words mean. And here there's some dispute. In the last 150 years, uh, some scholars have proposed that the root words aren't Hebrew uh, because, you know, languages borrow uh, words from each other. And we see that happening in Hebrew, just like in English, we borrow words from other languages. So, for example, the word sushi comes from Japanese and the word ketchup comes from Malaysian. Just be careful if you're putting ketchup on your sushi. Oh, you, people may not may not take kindly to that. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when the biblical authors borrow words from other languages, we can sometimes figure out what they mean, but our knowledge of ancient spoken languages is incomplete. And so sometimes we can't figure it out with confidence. And some scholars think that the Urim and Thummim were used by other people in the ancient Near East, and the Hebrews just adopted the words for them. If if that's the case, we may not be able to figure it out what the original words meant. What if that theory is wrong? What if there are native Hebrew words? 
in that case, their meaning would be fairly clear. And in support of this idea is the fact that ancient authors did take them as ordinary Hebrew words. Urim would be a plural form of the Hebrew word or, which means light. And thumim would be a plural form of the Hebrew word tom, which means completeness or perfection. Uh, Taken that way, urim and thumim would mean lights and perfections, which sounds kind of mysterious. However, there's also a proposal that we should understand the phrase urim and thumim as a hindiatus. Okay, that is a term not a lot of listeners will be familiar with, including me. What on earth is a hendiadis? It's a technical term in linguistics and literary scholarship. Uh, the word hendiadis comes from a couple of Greek roots that mean one through two. Uh, the idea is you convey one idea by using two words. And the way this works linguistically is you have the two words connected by and, and one of the words modifies the others, uh, the other. To give an example in English, uh, we have uh, a hendiatus in the form of the phrase nice and warm. To say that someone is nice and warm means that he is nicely warm. You know, that's a single condition. The person the person is not both nice on the one hand and warm on the other. Nicely warm is the single condition that the person is in. And so it's been proposed that Urim and Thumim or lights and perfections is a hindiatus that means perfect light or perfect lights. And that could make some sense in context, since when you consult God and he gives an answer, that answer will shed perfect light on the issue that you asked about. So it could be uh, natural to call the means by which you get this perfect light Urim Vethumim, or Urim and Thumim in Hebrew. But what were the Urim and Thumim? Physically, I mean. This is one of the biggest mysteries about them, and we don't really know. Uh, if the Hindiatus view is correct, uh, they might be just a single object, and the plural ending might refer to the plural decisions you get by using this object. But most people have understood the Urim and Thumim as being at least two objects, and possibly more than that, which we'll talk about later. What we do know is that the Urim and Thumim were one or more physical objects that were small enough to fit in the pouch or breast piece that the high priest wore on his chest. Uh, That's suggested by the very first passage where we read about them in Exodus 28. And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thumim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the sons of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. By saying that Aaron, the high priest, shall bear the judgment of the sons of Israel upon his heart, it doesn't mean that he'll bear the condemnation of the Israelites on his heart. In this case, like we said, the judgment refers to the decision that the high priest can get from God using the Urim and Thummim. In other words, the high priest will bear over his heart the means by which he can get a decision from the Lord about for the sons of Israel or about the sons of Israel. Uh, This is clearer in the way the New American Bible translates the same passage. In this breast piece of decision, you shall put the Urim and Thummim that they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus, he shall always bear the decisions for the Israelites over his heart in the presence of the Lord. Now, if you read the passage in context, you'll see detailed instructions are given for how to make the ephod and the breast piece, but there are no instructions given for how to make the urim and thumim. Also, elsewhere in the Pentateuch, there are detailed instructions for how to, how to do things, like the details of how to perform sacrifices, but there are no instructions for how to use the urim and thumim. And That has suggested to many scholars that these objects were not new 
Uh, they were something traditional that the Israelites already had and already knew how to use. So they didn't need instructions on how to make them or instructions on how to use them. They were something old that predated the Aaronic high priesthood. And that way, once the garments had been made for Aaron, they just had to put them into his breast piece where they, he would keep them and wear them before the Lord. And if the Urim and Thummim were old ritual objects that predated the high priesthood, they might be something the Israelites got in Egypt or from another ancient Near Eastern culture that they encountered, which is why some have suggested that the words may not be Hebrew. But it's also possible that the Urim and Thummim had been part of Israelite culture for a long time, and that the words are Hebrew, the way many ancient authors understood them to be. What's the first time we see the Urim and Thummim being used? It's a little unclear. Um, it's very likely that whenever the text someone says that someone inquired of the Lord, especially if the high priest is present, uh, that they did so by using the Urim and Thummim, even if it's not explicitly stated in the text. The first time that the objects are explicitly said to be used may be in 1 Samuel 14, during the period when Saul is king. At this point in his reign, Saul was fighting with the Philistines, and things weren't going so well, so Saul made a foolish oath. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul laid an oath on the people, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. And all the people came into the forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dropping, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath, so he put forth the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and dipped it in the honeycomb, and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes became bright. In other words, Saul, Saul's son Jonathan perked up because he had some of that high-carbohydrate honey, and Reading about people's performance suffering in battle because they didn't get to eat during the middle of the day just shows me how used to eating in the middle of the day they were. Um, as an intermittent faster who keeps a 22-hour fast, it's like, okay, you guys are a bunch of pikers. If you, were, <laughs> if you were used to not eating in the middle of the day, your performance wouldn't suffer. <laughs> but they were, uh, you know, people would eat in the middle of the day back then. In fact, in Arabic, the word for lunch is the meal of noon. And people have typically used when the sun is at its highest as a marker for, OK, it's time to eat now. But back to the biblical text. Then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, cursed be the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. Then Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have become bright because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found? For now the slaughter among the Philistines has not been great. Because of Saul's oath, the men of his army, after they defeated uh, the Philistines, immediately took the spoils and started killing sheep and oxen and calves. And they were so hungry that they didn't even drain the blood out of the animals first. They just started eating them with the blood still in them, which was a violation of the kosher food laws that Jews need to obey. So Saul uh, gets them to stop doing that. And then after they eat, he decides he wants to do a night raid on the Philistines. Philistines. Then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and despoil them until the morning light. Let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. But the priest said, Let us draw near here to God. And Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them, give them into the hand of Israel? The text doesn't say so, but they likely used the Urim and Thummim on this occasion. Uh, but just because you ask God a question doesn't mean he has to answer. But he did not answer him that day. And Saul said, come here, all you leaders of the people, and know and see how this sin has arisen today. So Saul thinks that God is not answering because one of his men has committed a sin. And he decides that whoever has committed the sin will be put to death. Saul said, for as the Lord lives who saves Israel, 
Though the sin be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. So the troops kept kept their mouth shut. Nobody was ratting anybody out. And thus Saul decides to find out who the person was that committed the sin. And he starts splitting people up into groups. In one group is all of the army except Saul and Jonathan. And in the second group, it's just Saul and Jonathan themselves. Then he said to all Israel, you shall be on one side and I and Jonathan, my son, will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. And here we come to what may be the first time the Urim and Thummim are explicitly said to be used. Uh, But there's a problem because what it says in the Hebrew text and what it says in the Greek Septuagint version of the passage are different. In the Hebrew text, it says, Then Saul said to Yahweh, the God of Israel, Render a decision perfectly. Jonathan and Saul were chosen by lot, and the people went out. So here the text says that they cast lots, and the lot indicated that the sinner was either Saul or Jonathan, not a member of the army in general. But here's the same passage from the Greek Septuagint. Therefore Saul said, O Lord God of Israel, why have you not answered your servant this day? If this guilt is in me or in Jonathan, my son, O Lord God of Israel, give Urim. But if this guilt is in your people, Israel, give Thamim. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. Here in the Greek version, it makes it explicit that they used the Urim and Thummim. If the sinner was either Saul or Jonathan, God would show the Urim. And if the sinner was someone in the army, he would show Thummim. And it turned out to be the former. Now, we're in a situation of high drama at this point because the sinner is either Saul or Jonathan. And Saul has said that whoever the sinner is, he's going to be executed. So either Saul or Jonathan is supposed to die, depending on the answer to the next question. Then Saul said, cast the lot between me and my son, Jonathan. And Jonathan was taken. You can imagine what Saul is feeling like as a father right now. I mean, his hands probably start to shake and his voice probably starts to quake. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am. I will die. And Saul said, God, do so to me and more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. So as painful as it must be for him, Saul's willing to go through with it. I mean, he's willing to execute his son. And if I wanted to give you a cliffhanger right now, I would have us do patron thanks and keep everyone in suspense. But (laughs) I want to be nice. So we'll delay that for a moment. And here's what happened next. Then the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die who has wrought this great victory in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he has wrought with God this day. So the people ransomed Jonathan that he did not die. Phew, the army stood up for Jonathan and forced Saul to back down. So Jonathan did not die that day. Well, even without a cliffhanger to, to bear so we do still want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make the show possible, including Oliver T., William N., Father Jason S., David P., and Lizzie G., Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about Urim in Thummim? Well, there are a bunch of them, but to keep things manageable, here are the main issues that we'll cover. What kind of questions could you ask and what kind of answers could you get? 
with the Urim and Thummim. Then, based on that, we'll see what we can figure out about what the Urim and Thummim may have been and how they worked. And from the faith perspective, how does the use of Urim and Thummim fit with other similar practices? Okay, what can we say about Urim and Thummim from the reason perspective? Before we get to the biblical data, I want to ask about another issue. The Urim and Thummim are also discussed in the Mormon religion. How are they understood there, and how does that compare with the Bible? Well, it's true that early Mormon documents talk about the Urim and Thummim, as they would pronounce them. Uh, For example, in the Mormon scripture known as Joseph Smith History, which contains Joseph Smith's account of the beginnings of Mormonism. He describes a vision in the year 1823 in which he saw an angel and he said, He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me and that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants of the Americas. Also that there were two stones in silver bows, and these stones, fastened to a breastplate, constituted what is called the Urim in Thummim, deposited with the plates. And the possession and use of these stones were what constituted seers in ancient or former times, and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. So Moroni tells Joseph Smith that he'll be shown a book written on golden plates, and that he'll also be shown two stones set in silver bows, like eyeglasses, uh, for translating the book, and that these are called the Urim and Thummim. That would give us a clear and explicit idea of what the Urim and Thummim are physically. Well, it would. Uh, they'd be basically a set of silver eyeglasses with stones for lenses. However, the details of what it says here don't correspond to what is said in the Bible. The angel says that the Urim and Thummim are fastened to a breastplate, presumably by a chain or cord. So you could wear the breastplate and put Uh, and then pull up the Urim and Thummim to wear over your eyes. However, that's not what Exodus describes. Uh, Setting aside the issue of whether they were a type of eyeglasses, it was a breast piece, not a breast plate that they were associated with. And we know that the breast piece was not solid because Exodus says it was to be made out of the same material that the ephod was, the blue, purple, and red yarn uh, uh, with twisted linen and golden threads. Also, the Urim and Thummim, to use the conventional pronunciation, were put into the breast piece, not attached to it by a chain or cord. Also, um, what the angel says uh, that in ancient times, having and using these stones was what constituted a seer is not what the Bible indicates. The, in the Bible, the Urim and Thummim were associated with the high priest, and the high priest was not a seer. Seers were prophets, and you didn't have to have the Urim and Thummim to be a prophet. Uh, there were lots of prophets, but there was only one high priest and only one set of Urim and Thummim. Finally, uh, the biblical Urim and Thummim were used to answer questions, to make inquiries of the Lord. They weren't a translation device. And so the biblical Urim and Thummim are different than the Mormon Urim and Thummim. Then let's look at the biblical data. What kind of questions could you ask using them? What kind of answers could you get? Well, one of the things that might happen is you might not get an answer at all. How would that happen? If you had this object or pair of objects or set of objects in the breast piece that you could use to inquire of God, how could they not give you an answer of some kind? One way is if you interrupted the answer, and we see, seem to see an example of that at an earlier point in 1 Samuel 14. This is at an earlier stage in the conflict with the Philistines, and Jonathan and his armor bearer have gone off on their own, and we read this. 
The watchmen of Saul in Gebeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who is gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor-bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here, for the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priests, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. It looks like what happened in this case, as the conflict with the Philistines is brewing, that Saul finds out that Jonathan and his armor bearer are missing. He then has the Ark of the Covenant brought to them so that the priest can inquire of the Lord about the situation. And the priest is reaching into the breast piece to draw out the Urim and Thummim to find out what the Lord will say. But since the chaos in the Philistine camp is growing, Saul tells the priest to withdraw his hand and not use the Urim and Thummim. And then everybody rushes into battle with the Philistines. So this looks like an interrupted inquiry of the Lord. So there was no answer. But the Bible also indicates that even if you didn't interrupt the answer, God could refuse to answer anyway. Yeah, you'll recall uh, that later in 1 Samuel 14, Saul had been inquiring of the Lord, but God wasn't taking his call. Uh, If they were using the Urim and Thummim in those inquiries, as is likely since the priest was there, it says, um, then that meant the Urim and Thummim could fail to deliver a message from God. Uh, Even if they weren't being used in that passage, However, it is later made clear that God could refuse to answer by means of them. Uh, In 1 Samuel 28, we read, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the wizards out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. That's what leads to the famous encounter with the witch or medium of Endor, who summons the spirit of the dead prophet Samuel, as we've discussed in previous episodes. And yes, the text indicates it is really Samuel, as the book of Sirach confirms in Sirach 4620. But the point for our purposes is that when Saul asked about the Philistines who were encamped against him, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. So the Urim and Thummim had to have some way of indicating that God wasn't going to answer. What about if God did answer? What kind of answers might you get? It depends on what you count as evidence. If the translators of the Greek Septuagint were right and the Urim and Thummim were being used when Saul was trying to find out who sinned, then it appears that you could get binary answers from God. The Septuagint has Saul saying, essentially, if if I or Jonathan am guilty, then give Urim, but if someone else is guilty, then give Thummim, which would indicate a binary yes, no, this or that kind of answer. Are there cases where a more complex kind of answer is given? It depends on whether you think the Urim and Thummim were being used whenever someone inquires of the Lord. If that's the case, then we have more data. In fact, a lot more data. Um, And it does indicate that God could give binary yes, no type answers. For example, in Judges 20, there is an internal dispute within Israel, and the other tribes are attacking the tribe of Benjamin, and we read, But the people, the men of Israel, took courage, and again formed the battle line in the same place where they had formed it on the first day. And the sons of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until the evening, and they inquired of the Lord, Shall we again draw near to the battle against our brethren the Benjaminites? And the Lord said, Go up against them. So that's a yes-no question. Shall we mount another offensive against the Benjaminites? And God gives a yes-no answer. In this case, yes, go up against them. 
But when we look at other inquiries of the Lord, we also see cases where the reply is more complex than a binary yes, no, this or that answer. For example, one of the earliest situations where people inquire of the Lord is found at the very beginning, so chapter one of the book of Judges. After the death of Joshua, the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. That sounds like a good bit of information. We have God indicating that out of the 12 tribes, Judah would be the one to go up. We also have the statement that God has given the land into his hand, meaning he will have success in battle. However, that last bit could be inferred rather than explicitly conveyed, or it could be an artifact from the biblical author summarizing the event in hindsight. But we do have an instance of the Urim and Thummim, if this is what's being used in this inquiry, uh, being used to get a one in 12 answer, uh, you know, which of the 12 tribes rather than a one in two yes, no type answer. Do we have even more complicated messages that were received? Yeah, perhaps the most complicated reply that the Bible records is found in 2 Samuel 5. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up, go around to their rear, and come upon them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then bestir yourself. For then the Lord has gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. So that one is a really complicated message with multiple elements. David is not to go up directly against the Philistines. He's to go around their rear and he's to approach them from opposite a grove of balsam trees. He's to await a He's to wait for a divine signal, the sound of God or his angels marching above the balsam trees, and that's when he's supposed to strike. So this is quite a complex message. A lot of these inquiries deal with matters of war and tactics. Do they ever inquire about other things? They do. Uh, for example, when Saul is first chosen king over Israel, he didn't want the job. So you have a scene where the prophet Samuel is using lots to inquire of God who is to be chosen king. And in 1 Samuel 10, we read, Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families, and the family of the Matrites was taken by Lot. Finally, he bought the family of the Matrites near, man by man, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Did the man come here? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and fetched him from there. I love that. Uh, Saul was hiding himself among the baggage and they had to run get him. But this is a case where they inquire of the Lord about something other than war and tactics. You know, they're looking for where is Saul? Um, and in principle, you could inquire of the Lord about anything. Was this a case where they were using the Urim and Thummim? That's not clear. Uh, on the one hand, Samuel is typically regarded more as a prophet than a priest, and he wasn't even a Levite. He belonged to the tribe of Ephraim, uh, but he was dedicated to service at the temple and was raised by the high priest. Also, while he's, desc while he's described here as using lots, there is a question of whether the Urim and Thummim may have simply been lots, as we'll discuss in a bit. But this brings up something that people need to be aware of. When people inquire of the Lord in the Bible, it is not always by means of Urim and Thummim. Later in the books of the prophets, there are unmistakable cases where people are inquiring of the Lord by talking to a prophet rather than by Urim and Thummim. So a key to figuring out whether they're being used is looking at the context. If people are inquiring of the Lord in the presence of a priest, 
a priestly ephod, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle or the temple, then they're consulting by priestly means. And so the Urim and Thummim are likely being used uh, since that's the one way we know was authorized for people to consult the Lord by priestly means. But if none of those things are mentioned, and if a prophet is mentioned, we should assume that they were consulting by prophetic means rather than by Urim. Um, if neither priestly things nor prophets are mentioned, then the situation is more ambiguous. Let's use what we've learned to see what we can figure out about what the Urim and Thummim were. What are the specific proposals that have been made? There are several. Uh, first, that they were two objects, only one of which would be drawn out of the breast piece at a time. Second, that they were two flat objects, both of which would be drawn out and then thrown down. In fact, uh, that's what you see in this episode's artwork. Uh, since Urim is thought to mean lights, it's been proposed that it was a light colored stone compared to a darker colored stone, which was the Thummim. Um, and these may have had the words Urim and Thummim written on one face. That's what's in the episode artwork, a light colored flat stone with Urim written on it and a dark colored flat stone with Thummim meme written on it. But that's just speculation. That's just one of the proposals for what they may have been. A third theory is that they were two or more objects that had multiple faces, allowing them to show different answers. Um, fourth, that they were multiple objects, perhaps as many as a couple of dozen that would be drawn out and or thrown down. Uh, fifth, that they should be understood as objects on the outside of the priest's garments rather than simply being held within the breast piece. And sixth, that they were a single crystal object. How can we sort through these possibilities? One of the things uh, to consider is what you could call the bandwidth issue. That is how much data the Urim and Thummim provided with a single answer. At the low end of the spectrum, the various yes, no, this or that answers could suggest that the Urim and Thummim conveyed only one bit of information per consultation. So they had only a one bit bandwidth. The problem then is how do you explain the other types of responses like the no answer responses or the very complex ones? How could you explain the no answer responses if the Urim and Thummim were two objects, only one of which would be drawn out of the breast piece at a time? The proposal that I've seen made is that the high priest might reach into his breast piece and occasionally pull out both the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, that would be possible if they were very small so that his fingers could easily grasp both without it being super obvious. And if the priest reached in and both came out, that would be a no answer signal. But I don't think this is probable. I think there's another explanation that's more likely and that would suggest a different nature for the Urim and Thummim. How would no answer work if the Urim and Thummim were two flat objects that we would be drawn out of the breast piece and then thrown down? The idea would be that you would throw the objects and then see what faces were showing. For example, the Urim might have the word Urim written on one face, but the other side would be blank. And the same would be true of the Thummim object. This would be a system that had two bits of bandwidth rather than just one. And what mathematicians refer to as the sample space would give us four options of what might come up when you threw the objects down. Uh, it could be Urim and blank, Thumim and blank, blank and blank, or both Urim and Thumim might turn up. Uh, if you got Urim blank, then that would be a clear yes. If you got Thumim blank, that would be a clear no. But if you got Urim Thumim or blank blank, that would be a non-answer because there wasn't a clear signal from the Lord. And by the way, yes, I do love applying modern data processing terminology to biblical exegesis and talking about bandwidth, bits of data, and whether you're getting a clear signal from the Lord. <laughs> Other than the yes-no answers that were frequently given, is there other evidence for the idea that the Urim and Thummim functioned like lots that were drawn or thrown? 
One of the best places would be the Septuagint version of 1 Samuel 14, where Saul has the Urim and Thummim used to distinguish between him and Jonathan. In that passage, the Greek word klerao is used, which unmistakably means casting lots. Uh, Indeed, klerao is where we get the word kleromancy, which is divination by casting lots. In the Hebrew text, the verb Hapilu is used, and that means cast or cast down. So lots are clearly being used there. But the Hebrew text doesn't mention the Urim and Thummim. That's only in the Greek Septuagint. So if the Hebrew text is correct, they may not have been using the Urim and Thummim, but just casting ordinary lots. Do we know whether the Greek or the Hebrew version of the text is correct? There are arguments on both sides. Uh, The Greek text makes a lot of sense, and sometimes the Septuagint does preserve the better reading than the Hebrew. Just because something is in Hebrew doesn't mean it's the original reading. Sometimes the original reading is better preserved in a different text than the Hebrew Masoretic text that later rabbis used. In this case, uh, the arguments for the Septuagint reading are strong enough that a lot of scholars have been convinced, and quite a number of major Bible translations are based on the Greek rather than the Hebrew reading of this passage. What about arguments against the Greek reading? The article on the Urim and Thummim in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, Difficulties with the Septuagint of 1 Samuel 1441 have been pointed out, however. It seems unlikely that so much significant material could have been omitted accidentally from the Masoretic text. Moreover, the Septuagint has the tendency in 1 Samuel to amplify and interpret. The Masoretic text is supported by Targum Jonathan and the Syriac Peshitta. Furthermore, the context of God's refusal to answer by Urim and Thummim that day, which was said earlier in verse 37, argues against their being employed later the same day. So there are significant arguments on both sides, and I don't have a firm view on which is correct. What are the arguments against the Urim and Thummim being lots? Basically, there are two. Uh, First, if you set aside the Septuagint reading of 1 Samuel 14, there aren't any clear cases where the Hebrew terminology used for lots is applied to the Urim and Thummim. They're not clearly described functioning like lots elsewhere. And second, uh, some of the answers give way more information than scholars expect to come from lots that are designed to answer yes-no questions or pick the one guy out of 12 questions. Then let's look at the theories that the Urim and Thummim were something other than lots. And what are the options? There are essentially three that fall into this group, and we mentioned them briefly earlier. First, they may have been objects that had multiple surfaces, like multi-sided dice with the Hebrew with the letters of the Hebrew alphabet written on them. The high priest could then have thrown them down and used the results to determine words in the Hebrew language, which was only written in consonants at the time, making it much easier to form words. You know, you see three, most Hebrew words are written with three consonants. And so you roll, you roll these objects and you look at which which consonants appear on the upturned faces and you stitch them together to make words. Uh, Second, they could have been a whole bunch of different objects, perhaps one corresponding to each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the high priest would reach into the breast piece and maybe stir them around and pull some out and throw them down and see what words he could form out of them. Finally, uh, there's the idea they weren't actually inside the breast piece, but were more on it. We know that the breast piece had different kinds of precious stones on the outside of it, and these stones had the names of the tribes of Israel written on them. So maybe something happened with the letters on the stones that the high priest could use to form words. And any of these theories could explain the higher bandwidth messages they sometimes seem to receive. Do you have any evidence that one of them is, was the case? I have an argument that has occurred to me, but I haven't seen anyone fully explored in the literature, and it has to do with the names Urim and Thmim. This won't be obvious 
to English speakers, but you could conceive of Urim and Thummim as representing the equivalent of A to Z. It would be kind of like us having a divination method known as alligators and zebras. You know, alligators starts with A and zebras starts with Z. And since those are the first and last letters of the English alphabet, they could suggest not only A and Z, but all of the letters in between them, the whole alphabet. How would Urim and Thummim represent the equivalent of A and Z to Hebrew speakers? The first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph. And uh, since the Hebrew alphabet at the time was written in consonants, Aleph is not the letter A. It's actually it's not a vowel. It's actually a consonant. Um, a consonant is a sound we make when we restrict the airflow going through our vocal track in one way or another, as opposed to a vowel where we shape the airflow, but let more of it go through. That's why you find uh, consonants and vowels alternating in words. We alter we alternatively either restrict the air producing consonants or we let it flow more freely producing vowels. Aleph is a consonant that represents the sound of a glottal stop where you pinch off the airflow coming through your throat like this. You can hear it a glottal stop in the Cockney pronunciation of the phrase a little bottle, where it gets pronounced a little bottle. Uh, we actually use this sound in standard English all the time, but we're unaware of it because we don't have a letter of our alphabet for it. So we never write it down and we never think about it. Um, but you can hear it on the front of words that begin with vowels or that we perceive as beginning with vowels. That's why we say apple instead of apple. You know, listen closely for the glottal stop at the beginning. Apple rather than apple. There's actually a glottal stop right on the front of that word, but we don't write it down uh, when we spell the word, since we don't have a letter in our alphabet for it, they do in other languages, like in Hebrew, it's Aleph and in Arabic, it's Hamza. Um, but, you know, Hebrew does have a letter for the glottal stop, and it happens to be the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And like in English, the glottal stop is often used on the front of Hebrew words that begin with what we would think of as vowels. One of them is the Hebrew word Or, which means light. So, urim actually starts with the letter aleph. Meanwhile, the word thumim starts with the letter tav, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And with urim starting with the first letter and thumim starting with the last letter, they could be the equivalent of alligators and zebras or A to Z representing the whole Hebrew alphabet. That could suggest one of the one of the three high bandwidth alphabetic options could be the case. But just because that's an argument that occurred to me and that I haven't seen others develop, so in a sense it's my argument, that doesn't mean it's true or that I'm going to be any kinder to it than I would be to other arguments. Apart from the length of the responses, do we have evidence that any of the three alphabetic theories are true? There is some in later Jewish sources, meaning sources like the first century historian Josephus and the even later rabbis who wrote the Mishnah and the Talmud. Uh, Josephus says that the stones on the high priest garment would glow with light in ways that would signify God's will. Uh, But there are three problems with that. First, Josephus doesn't connect that explicitly with the Urim and Thummim. He doesn't mention them. Uh, He just talks about these glowing stones signifying God's will. Second, he certainly doesn't connect the glowing with particular letters on the stones, you know, because you'll remember the names of the Hebrew tribes were written on them. Uh, And third, he says this stopped happening 200 years before his time because God was unhappy with the people. So Josephus never saw this happening, and it could just be a legend he heard. What about what the rabbis said? There is a passage in the Talmud, which we'll have a link to, that says the letters on the stones uh, were what provided the answer, but it doesn't 
record a clear explanation of how they did that. Uh, instead, it just mentions the claims of two rabbis that lived in the second and third centuries AD. And one of them says that the letters needed for the reply would protrude. So the high priest could notice them protruding, I guess. And the other rabbi says that the letters would rearrange themselves. Um, but there are problems here, too. Uh, first, I don't think either the idea of the letters on the stones protruding, you know, I mean, stones are pretty fixed in shape. Um, it would be a pretty weird miracle for God to have certain letters suddenly extruding themselves somehow from the surface of the stone um, or rearranging themselves from stone to stone. That would be even weirder. So I don't think those are particularly likely. They're not consistent with other miracles we've seen. Um, and second, these rabbis also lived after the time the breastpiece was supposed to have stopped working. Uh, in fact, the authors of the Talmud say that it stopped working even earlier than Josephus said. Uh, they said, or some of the authors of the Talmud said it stopped at the time Solomon's temple was destroyed, which was centuries earlier. Uh, and they then say that the Urim and Thummim weren't used in the second temple. So they definitely did not see the process in action or have firsthand accounts of how it worked. What about the fact that the biblical text says that the Urim and Thummim were in the breast piece rather than on it, like the stones with the names of the tribes of Israel. This is a reasonable argument and one I've seen scholars use, but I don't think it's definitive. Uh, prepositions like in, on, and at are notoriously fuzzy and we and they have a significant amount of overlap. If you've ever studied other languages, you know how difficult it can be to translate uh, prepositions precisely. Even in English, we have different uses for the same prepositions in different dialects of English. Like when I listen to British television, I'm constantly hearing different preposition uses. Like people will say, this is different to that rather than this is different from that. And Hebrew prepositions are just as ambiguous as English ones. So if they sewed or attached the, uh, the stones to or on the breast piece, or even if they put them inside so that they poke out through holes in the breast piece, I can't rule out that this could be described as putting them in the breast piece. In terms of biblical evidence, the major argument in favor of the alphabetic theories is the longer replies that are sometimes given. How strong do you think that argument is? Not nearly as strong as some scholars think. Um, I've seen it uh, said that the lot theory is simply unimaginable, you know, to use their word, in the case where David gets the revelation about sneaking around the trees and listening for the angels in the top of the trees. After I read that, I thought, you're thinking like a modern scholar who's raised in a secularized, hyper-efficient 20th century nation, uh, not like someone from a slower-paced, supernatural-believing nation. You, you don't know much about the history of parapsychology. Um, and this is one of those cases where having a knowledge of the things we talk about on Mysterious World can be a benefit. Low bandwidth doesn't determine what kind of answers you can ultimately get. It just means it's going to take longer and you may have to ask more questions to get detailed answers. Kind of like when people play the game 20 questions. Even if an individual answer is a binary yes, no one, they can eventually get to a very specific result. A modern scholar sitting at his desk might not be very patient in asking a long series of yes, no questions, but people in other situations are. Uh, for example, when the spiritualist movement began in New York State in 1848 with the Fox sisters, who will, we mentioned them before, and we'll talk about them more in the future, uh, the communications they had with the spirits were based around listening for the spirits to make a certain number of knocking sounds to answer yes, no questions, you know, like one for yes, two for no. Um, they also developed a way of letting the spirits painstakingly keep knocking to, to indicate numbers or letters of the alphabet. So like one knock for A, two knocks for B, 19 knocks for S, 
20 knocks for tea and so forth. And they'd sit there and listen patiently while the spirits slowly spelled out words, knocking out a single letter at a time. The Fox sisters and many of their early imitators were physical mediums who communicated with the spirits by using physical sounds like knocking. And it took a while before you got a lot of mental mediums who would communicate swiftly and verbally with the spirits. So with a knowledge of the history of parapsychology, yes, people can have the patience to ask multiple questions and wait for complex answers to be delivered over a low bandwidth connection with the supernatural world. And if that was true of the sitters at 19th century seances who were just talking to the spirits of dead loved ones to try to make sure they were okay, or that's what they thought they were doing, well, then you better believe that the Hebrews would wait for God himself to give them a complex answer regarding a life and death matter, like what tactics you need to use in the battle you're about to fight. So you don't think that the complexity of these answers is a fully convincing argument in favor of the alphabetic theories of the Urim and Thummim? No, and there are other problems with it. For example, the Jewish encyclopedia points out, In all cases except 1 Samuel 10.22 and 2 Samuel 5.23 and following, the answer is either yes or no. So 1 Samuel 10.22 10.22 is the passage where they catch Saul hiding among the baggage. And 2 Samuel 5 is the passage where David gets the detailed battle instructions. These are the only two cases where the reply can't be understood as a basically binary yes-no type answer. Uh, in other cases, the answer may be interpreted as something like, go up to battle, you will have success. But that's can be seen as basically a yes response. It's just interpreted in a kind of, you know, more fleshed out way. But the basic answer still looks binary. Do you go up or not? Um, And if those two passages, 1 Samuel 10 and 2 Samuel 5, are the only two where an answer looks fundamentally non-binary, then that suggests we should take a closer look at those two passages as outliers to see whether they're really representative of how the Urim and Thummim would have worked. And what do you see when you do that? I don't see that they have to involve the Urim and Thummim at all. Uh, In the case of 1 Samuel 10, the prophet Samuel has been casting lots among the tribes to find the king. And the Urim and Thummim are not mentioned. And neither is there a mention of the high priest or the ephod or the Ark of the Covenant either. Uh, It says that they inquired of the Lord, but Samuel was a prophet. As a result, he could have uh, set aside the lots that he'd been using to identify the king and just asked God directly where Saul was hiding himself and gotten a verbal reply. So in light of the fact that a prophet was present when this inquiry was made, and in light of the complex answer, we can't assume that this tells us about the Urim and Thummim. What about the passage where David gets his battle plans? That passage uh, does say that David inquired of God, but there is no mention of the Urim and Thummim or the high priest or the ephod or the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, And there is simply and there's certainly no mention of the temple because this was before the temple was built. So there's no indication that the high priest was involved in this incident. In fact, if we go back to the way the text is structured, David doesn't call for the ark until the next chapter of the book, which could suggest it wasn't with him at the time. And since the high priest with his ephod and the Urim and Thummim would be expected to be with the ark, that would suggest that they weren't with David in this case, and he didn't use them. You'll recall that when Saul tried inquiring of the Lord in 1 Samuel 28, it said that God didn't answer him by dreams or by Urim, or by prophets. So there were three ways of inquiring of the Lord, and the Urim and Thummim were just one of them. Uh, The fact that we don't have an indication of the high priest being involved here 
and that we get an uncharacteristically complex answer to the inquiry makes it natural to understand this incident as involving one of the other two ways of inquiring of the Lord. Either David inquired of the Lord and got his battle plans in a dream, or he got them from a prophet he had with him. It's as simple as that. So, no, I don't think that the passages where we have unambiguously complex answers can be counted upon to tell us anything about the Urim and Thummim, despite my personal A to Z argument. Uh, It may be mine in the sense that I thought of it, but I want to be as harsh on my own arguments as any other, and ultimately I don't think this one works. Before we move on to the faith perspective, let's look oh, at the last. I, I would say, though, my the, my A to Z theory could be true in the sense that um, the Urim and Thummim will give you any kind of answer from A to Z. But that doesn't mean it uses the letters of the Hebrew alphabet to do that. OK, so that last theory you mentioned that the Urim and Thummim were a single object that was a crystal. What can we say about that? This one has been proposed by Cornelius Van Dam, and he gives a summary of it in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Nowhere does the Old Testament state how the Urim and Thummim were used. In view of the above factors, however, including the complex answers sometimes given, the following theory can be proposed. If the Masoretic vocalization of Urim and Thummim is accepted as evidence, descriptive of this oracular means, the use of Urim by itself in 1 Samuel 28.6 could indicate that light was a vital characteristic of this oracular means, and the terms could be understood as a hendiadis with the translation perfect light. Possibly a special or miraculous light was somehow involved in the functioning of the Urim and Thummim in order to verify that the message given was from God. In this way, the judgment of the Urim, light, could conceivably have been given. The Urim and Thamim may thus have been a single gem, a special sign of verification associated with the Urim and Thamim would not have been out of place in an age when God more often gave miraculous authenticating signs. So on this theory, the Urim and Thummim were a single gem that the high priest would look at and would see something involving light, kind of like a spheromancer would gaze into a crystal ball. And the high priest would then interpret this uh, thing he saw and deliver a message from the Lord. So I've seen uh, variations on this theory proposed as well, like maybe the Urim and Thummim were a golden disc he might gaze at. But Notice the number of qualifiers that Van Dam uses in his argument. In view of the above factors, if the Masoretic vocalization is accepted as evidence, could indicate, could be understood, possibly a special or miraculous light, somehow involved, could conceivably have been given, may thus have been a single gem, would not have been out of place in an age like this. I mean, that is a lot of qualifiers, uh, far too many to be at all confident of this interpretation. Also, notice that this view is driven by the idea that the Urim and Thummim gave complex answers, which Van Dam accepts. But we've seen significant evidence already that the only two cases where that clearly happens are outliers that can't be relied upon to tell us anything about the Urim and Thummim. So the principal driver of his argument, I don't think, has weight. So in the end, what do you think the Urim and Thummim physically were? I don't know, but in light of the fact that binary yes-no style answers uh, seem to be characteristic of them, I think that they were most likely two objects that functioned like lots and that were drawn or thrown down, which is the view that most scholars have supported. Okay, so now what can we say about the Urim and Thummim from the faith perspective? If they functioned like lots, then that would make their use a form of sortilage. Uh, Sortilage is a practice we've discussed in previous episodes, and listeners can go back and review episodes 79 and 106 to learn more about it. But basically, the Latin word for a lot is sores. And so sortilage is the process of reading lots um, from sort 
uh, sortes, plural lots, and legere, to read. So sortilege is reading the lots. Um, also, uh, the Greek word for lot is kleros, which means lot and if you read lots to get uh, information, it's known as cleromancy. In essence, what happens is humans use a process whose outcome they do not control, such as which lot comes up, and then they ask a higher power like God or the gods to control the outcome for them and reveal his will. In this case, uh, the Urim and Thummim were serving as lots, and uh, numerous forms of this basic practice have been used in many cultures as forms of divination. Doesn't the Old Testament forbid divination? It depends on what you classify as divination. As we covered in episode 79 on religion, magic, uh, science, and psychic phenomena, the fundamental difference between magic and a religious ritual is that one is approved and the other is not. Magic involves unapproved rituals, while religion uh, involves a set of approved rituals. The pagans around ancient Israel used rituals to discern the wills of their pagan gods, and those rites were unapproved for Israelites. Uh, but God promised to reveal his will to the Israelites through this ritual, making it approved for them. Um, the fundamental problem is not the ritual, but who you're using it to inquire of. And God accepted this ritual of the Urim and Thummim as a way of inquiring of him. Are there any further lessons we can learn here from the Urim and Thummim? One of the things that they show us is that there was a special kind of guidance that God gave the Israelites through the high priest. Uh, it was a limited form of guidance and not as robust as uh, what he often gave through the prophets, but it was real. Also, at some point before the time of Christ, the Urim and Thummim apparently ceased to be used. In fact, we don't have a clear record of them being used, not an explicit record of them being used, after the time of King David, though the books of Ezra and Nehemiah do still envision the possibility of them being used. Why might they have fallen out of use? One of the reasons was likely the rise of the office of prophet. Uh, and Jewish leaders came to rely more on prophets than on high priests for divine guidance. Thus, the earlier uh, inquiries of the Lord more frequently involved the priests, and the later ones more often involved the prophets. But still, there was an association between the office of high priest and some kind of divine guidance. We even see that in the New Testament. In John chapter 11, after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, we read, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, issued a prophecy about Jesus without even realizing it or fully understanding what he was saying, even though he was in the very act of plotting the death of the Messiah, God still guided him. The high priest was the divinely appointed religious leader of God's people on earth, and today the pope is the divinely appointed religious leader of God's earthly people. Are there any lessons for us in this regard? The Catholic Church doesn't claim that the Pope receives revelations from God. He's not divinely inspired like the authors of Scripture, nor does he receive visions like prophets or visionaries. But the Church does hold that the people of God can inquire of him to provide definitive interpretations of what has already been revealed. On the rare occasions when he issues a definitive interpretation, God gives him a form of guidance that results in the interpretation being guaranteed to be true or infallible. 
Although the form has changed, both the Old Testament high priest and the Pope receive guidance that produces responses that can be protected from error. In the Old Testament, this was through the Urim and Thummim, and even though they ceased to be used before the time of Christ, the special guidance of the high priest remained. As a result, there is a continuity between the Old Testament high priests and the New Testament high priests like Caiaphas and the Pope. Um, I noticed this uh, back when I was in the process of becoming Catholic, and as an apologist, I've pointed it out. Uh, I've since seen other Catholic apologists pointing it out also, but I've done some checking, and based on the reading I've done, this parallel seems to have originated in apologetic literature with me, so I'm staking my claim. Credit, if you want to use. Um, despite the differences in the way that the guidance uh, manifested in the past and the way it manifests today, it's legitimate to see uh, the religious leader of God's earthly people as having a special form of guidance, which was originally manifested in the Urim and Thummim, and today, at least from a Catholic perspective, manifests in the gift of papal infallibility. Mm. So, Jimmy, what is your bottom line? A bottom line on the Urim and Thummim. The evidence suggests that the Urim and Thummim were two distinct objects kept inside the breastpiece of the Jewish high priest. Their nature and precisely how they functioned remains mysterious, but they appear to have functioned like lots, capable in most circumstances of giving binary yes-no type answers. Uh, there are outlier cases that are more naturally explained in terms of other means of consulting the Lord, and they reveal a form of limited divine guidance given to the earthly leader of God's people. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers on this topic? We'll have a link to the Dictionary of the Old Testament and specifically the Pentateuch volume that uh, we quoted earlier. Also, the volume of the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia that covers the Urim and Thummim. We'll have an article on Tyrian purple on Murex sea snails. Uh, also, uh, the Mormon scripture, Joseph Smith history, uh, the Jewish encyclopedia article on the Urim and Thummim, as well as a Talmud passage discussing them. And finally, information on sortilage and claromancy. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? This week, we have a man's best friend theme. So we're talking about our friends, the dogs. Um, one of the sites we'll have a link to is a um, Daily Mail online piece that can help you see the way that dogs see. It's, it's really nicely done. They have a series of photographs of different uh, tourist sites in Britain, and they have a slider vertically for each of these pictures so that you can see it the human way and then pull the slider across the image to see how a dog would view it. Because dogs uh, don't have the full color perception that humans do. Um, they're missing certain colors. And also their vision is not as acute as ours. Um, it's blurrier, estimates between like four and eight times blurrier than ours. So dogs are kind of nearsighted or blurry sighted in any event. And because of the positioning of their eyes on their heads, they don't have the same kind of 3D vision that we do. Um, so, uh, take a look and, you know, pull the sliders back and forth to compare the human view and the dog view of the same scenes. But even if dogs aren't as good at, we are at viewing things with vision, their sense of smell is out of this world compared to ours. It's tens or hundreds of thousands of times more sensitive, depending on the breed. And that has led to dogs being used, at least experimentally, to detect diseases, and because they can they can smell, um, you know, different infections that people have. They can smell things like cancer and stuff like that as well. And so there's more discussion now about the possibility of using dogs in a diagnostic setting. And that doesn't necessarily mean taking them around patients. You know, some patients are afraid of dogs. Also, 
some dogs just get too excited, be all the distractions with the patients and other people. But um, they have been looking at the possibility of like taking samples from patients and then having a sniffer dog identify which samples are infected and which aren't. And they can apparently detect COVID and they can detect a bunch of other stuff. So check out the article we'll have on disease detecting dogs as medical assistants and how they be may they could in the future be approved for clinical use, not just experimentally. You really are a man's best friend. Yeah. So that's it from us this time. We would love to hear your theories about the mysterious Urim and Thummim and how they may have been used. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Send a tweet to at mys underscore world. You can also reply in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, where we have a vibrant discussion on every episode as it comes out. You should check it out. Or call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode and that they do on Mysterious World in general. Uh, if you have needs for uh, video editing services, please check out their work. Uh, you can see it uh, at my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. I've been getting a lot of feedback from people who have been longtime listeners and only recently have checked out the videos. And it's like, wow, these are so much, uh, so much more impressive uh, than they used to be in the past. I mean, in the past, we started with just static image cards for our YouTube version. And now we've got not only motion video, but also animations and lots of clarifying things that you'll see on screen that we we can't really share in the audio stream. So definitely check out youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I am trying to grow my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and hit the bell notifications so that you'll always get a notification whenever I put out a video, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next week, we're going to be looking at a psychic medium named Robert Riggi. He has a very dramatic life story, and he's been he's been appearing on lots of podcasts. So we'll be looking at the techniques that you can use to investigate uh, the claims being made uh, by him and by other people to find out whether they're really true. Excellent. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, on Spotify, Stitcher, tune in in your favorite podcast app, or like we said, at youtube.com slash Jimmy Akin. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 215. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Quest.